Welcome to No Password Required, a monthly conversation that introduces you to some of the top talent in the world of cybersecurity. Hello and welcome to No Password Required, a podcast dedicated to exploring the minds and personalities that make up the field of cybersecurity. I'm your host, Ernie Ferraresso, and with me as always is Jack Clabby, a cybersecurity attorney at Carton Fields, PA in Tampa, and Pablo Torres, a senior cloud security engineer at Second Watch. On the podcast today, we'll chat with Thomas Vaughn, the chief information security officer at the city of Tallahassee. Over his 27 years in information security, Thomas has developed a wealth of technical knowledge and a deep understanding of emergency operations, physical security, and strategic planning. Thomas, we look forward to a great conversation. But first, hello to my co-hosts, Jack and Pablo. Gentlemen, good day. Good day, Ernie. Good day, Ernie. How are you? Oh, every day. A little bit better than the last. So I guess we're going to talk about the our, our friend and colleague that we don't know down at University of Central Florida who started tracking Elon Musk's jet. Yeah, I love this. I- I love this idea. You've got a 19-year-old who dabbles in in web applications and apps, and he gets a hold of publicly available data. You know, there is a, um, it's called the ADS-B exchange. It's a publicly available data that has transponders from all the planes that are uh, flying around in the country right now. Uh, this the, the, F, the FAA requires that these transponders communicate their altitude and their general heading uh, in speed at all times so that they don't hit each other. And, you know, this the the 19-year-old college kid, you know, kind of takes this data, automates it, uh, and sticks it up on Twitter for a few people, but most particularly Elon Musk. <laughs> Elon Musk finds out about this, reaches out, is sort of one-on-one, and uh, at first off, you know, just says, hey, can you take it down? It's a privacy issue. And then ends up offering the, the student $5,000, the student uh, counter offers, you know, as it's been reported for 50000 uh, I think kind of jokingly, or a Tesla. Uh, and then I think uh, he says, look, I'll settle for an internship. Come on. Uh, and uh, Elon Musk blocks him and does not, does not in fact, pay, pay anything. And I think uh, an Orlando area uh, competitor of NetJets, though, did reach out to the student and offered him an internship. So the story ends okay. Uh, I believe the, the Twitter... Uh, for Elon Musk, uh, where his jet is located, is still public. So it's still happening uh, these days. Now, when I was a prosecutor many years ago, we had this issue come up a few times, but back then it was called uh, tail spotting. It was yeah. folks, you know, it still goes on, folks who stand outside airports, a lot of municipal airports, and they they look at the the sort of sign for the, you know, the numbers that are on the tail of the, of the jet and they, yeah, the, the end number. Yeah. yeah November or whatever. Yeah. One, two, three, right. four, five, yeah, six. Some, and, yeah. and there were services going back as far as the eighties where stock speculators could subscribe and find out where CEOs planes were going, you know, and if, if the CEO of Megatech a goes to, you know, goes to the city where Megatech B is, is located, maybe, the, going yeah, on? maybe there's oh, a merger. Yeah. Uh, and there's also been some, some academic literature that that says that you know CEOs return from vacation if good or bad news is going to be announced, and so the return of a CEO's jet to the home office means that something bad could be coming. It, it might be an opportunity to short the stock. So there is a history, you know, going back forty years of um, tracking where these executives are going and trading on it. And I know some newspapers have uh, newspapers. I'm dating myself. Uh, Online news outlets or, or cable news channels. <laughs> it's too late. What it's is, already out there. What's, Jack. It, what's, it, what's in the metaverse, Ernie? Uh, that's right. But, that's right. I, yeah, I put on my yeah. uh, my Oculus and I was. That's, you know, that's I was, right. Yeah, we're all in Oculus right now. But that's uh, right. As far as everybody well, knows, it's a simulation within a simulation, Pablo. Right. That's right. So, that's right. <laughs> but it's that, that's what it. So there's privacy concerns here. There's FAA concerns. There's there's so much going on. But it's data that the government makes public, and then. And then it's people who access public data and use it in a way that makes it seem like it's impringing, you know, in, in rubbing up against privacy concerns. Yeah, I think I think the I think the student himself is a young entrepreneur, very 
interesting way to use data because currently Elon Musk finds himself in Austin, Texas, and the the, the profile itself on Twitter has uh, gone ahead and racked up 21,000 followers. So, I mean, there's a pretty significant footprint that this Twitter uh, is making, but um, that's interesting about trading off of the location that the CEOs are at, Jack. Yeah. That, that's some interesting data right there. Yeah, it's, you know, following campaigns, Jets, when someone's going to pick a vice president, I think, uh, trading off of it. And, you know, in terms of tail spotting, the original sort of tail spotting, it's not illegal to do as long as you're taking a photograph or recording the information from a public place. And so after 9-11, there was some, yeah. there was some caution around it because uh, I think some of the people who were watching the tails were getting too close, but that's not a very effective lens to view the issue from. I mean, there's a lot of public information there about a lot of us. Uh, and and yeah. there are, you know, websites that aggregate that information. It's pretty terrifying when you look when oh, yeah. you look at what you can learn just from publicly available data about someone, and particularly you know, think about in states where where home purchases are public information, you can just Google yeah, home, oh, yeah. Know, where someone lives and, and how much they pay for their house, and so so there's a lot of this stuff. It's it's using publicly available information to create a profile of someone that makes it look um, like you've done something that offends privacy notions in a general. Yeah, well, that's I think that's the same. Uh, you know, what you, what you hit on there, Jack, is I don't think people realize um, in addition to what they're putting out on their own social media, t- you know, themselves sharing, you know, who knows what. Um, but just what is what is public – what is what is listed as publicly available information? I mean you can go to uh, – your and go to any tax yeah. uh, tax website and you can look up the apartment – who owns it, when they bought it. You can look up people's – what they – all those types of things. Your voter registration data, it's all – uh, publicly available. It's not. Uh, I guess the uh, the proper term is it's not on the open web. It's on the deep web, yeah. meaning you can't Google search it. But if you go to the to that county or city's website, you can then yep. go to the next level well, on that. And it's yeah. all public information. Well, but when it's uh, go well, ahead. Geolocation, yeah. like so, geolocation data standing alone, like yeah, is is considered personal information. So so a phone, you're carrying a phone around. You know, the carrier for that phone, if there's a breach of the geolocation data there, yeah. that is that is considered a breach of personal personal information under the law. And I think we all would agree, seems reasonable, right? Geolocation of an individual. The, the sort of twist is that this is public information that the FAA requires, right? That's twist number one. And then twist number two is that it's the location of the plane. It's yes. not the location of Elon Musk. And it's... And it's when when the you know the companies have been asked about this who are who are involved in the chain of uh, of this information being made, made public, that's the distinction I think that they point to, is well that anyone could be on the plane. I'm not saying that it's Elon Musk. Uh, it's the, it's that little twist. And so you know, the next application of this and and it's being solved right now is uh, cars. So yep. as cars get smarter and as roads get smarter. Um, your car is communicating with the road. Your car is communicating with other cars. Your car is communicating potentially with an insurance company. Uh, so you've got which. Oh, by the way, they can do that already. Right, they're all, people ask them to do it. You plug it in, and we'll give you a discount. Is this personal information or is this the car's information? Even though I'm the one who uh, you know, I'm the only driver of the car. You know, so it's a it's a great distinction. I'd love for it to hold. It would make it easier uh, for those of us who advise the industry on privacy concerns. But I think as a, as a I think the way that the public sees it. Let's see. I, let, let, let's see where this goes. Because if, if like the national transportation, you know, NTSB requires that information to be made public after a crash, are they going to look at it the same way that the FAA looks at transponder information for airplanes? Is it going to be public information or not? So, uh, lo- a lot. This kind of hilarious story of this 19-year-old entrepreneur raises, I think, a lot of issues that we're going to be wrestling with. Because there's not a lot of private jets, but oh boy, are there a lot of private cars. Yeah. Well, and especially as you start, and now I'm going to get all kind of futurist, we start increasing the computing power. Uh, if we talk about, you know, quantum and all those types of things, we're in artificial uh, overlaying some of these, you know, machine learning out that allows you to process a lot of data. And now you can process a lot of data really, really fast. So now, you know, what is that going to, uh, you know, you're going to be able to, to comb through the, these these mountains of data and who knows what type of predictions are going to be. So it's a, a bleak, bleak future. No, I do want to believe this is going to have some sort of privacy implications and we're, we're definitely going to see some downstream impact when it comes to, 
what people want to actually publicly put out into the world with their locations. Um, that's the, the cars are scary because you, you know where you're parking at at the end of the night. Yeah. Yeah. The, I mean, that's you start talking about, you know, patterns of lives and things and yeah. interesting stuff. Again, uh, like we say, we're uh, interesting times here in the 2022 <laughs> going on into the into the future. Um, and that said, we're going to uh, we're going to pause our journey into the future. We're going to take a quick break. Um, and when we return, we're going to talk to uh, Thomas about his life in the cybersecurity world and how his technical experience in the Army and the Coast Guard opened up opportunities that, uh, that still blow his mind and shape his philosopher's thinking. So stick around. Looking for more no password required content? Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn at No Password Pod. Okay, welcome back. Uh, our guest today is Thomas Vaughn, a CISO who tends to think philosophically. Mr. Vaughn, just in case you change your mind about social media, the CISO philosopher handle is available on Twitter. Uh, Thomas, welcome, welcome to the uh, welcome to No Password Required. We are we are just delighted that you're taking time out of your day here to be with us. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thomas, can you tell us a little bit about your career path and how it led to your current role uh, as the CISO of the city of Tallahassee? Well, you know, like most young men leaving high school, I didn't really have a plan. So, I, you know, to say career path, it's more like career meandering, I think is what <laughs> I call it. Um, you know, so I, I went after high school, I went right into the Army, and this was a, a few years back, late 80s to be exact. And um, I went into the Army specifically to be an airborne medic. I was going to go jump out of airplanes and patch people up, and it was just it seemed like a really cool thing, very romantic. And I got into Army basic training, and they said, they pulled four of us aside out of like 60 people, and they said, the four of you have high enough ASVAB scores, you're smart enough to be in military intelligence, and we desperately need people. And the other three with me said, no thanks, and they walked away, and I said, well, I said, where's, where are the schools? Where do I go after basic training? Because all I could think was, you know, like two months out. And um, they said, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he said, Pensacola, Florida. I said, so. <laughs> so I ended up doing intelligence work in the Army. I was specifically doing signals intelligence, intercepting, you know, the Soviets and East Germans, all that scary stuff. And uh, I was actually in Berlin when the wall came wow. down. Um, so, you know, I did my four years in the Army and I got out at the end of the Cold War and I quickly realized that um, the only thing I knew how to do was was be a military person to wear a uniform. So I quickly looked for another service. Uh, most of the services didn't want me because they were drawn down. So I ended up in the Coast Guard, of all things. And um, at the time, I didn't really know what I was getting into, but I spent 20 years in the Coast Guard did a lot of different stuff in the Coast Guard, but there was always sort of a technology base to the work I was doing. I did a lot of IT work in different areas, did some communications work. I was an intelligence officer for a while toward the end of my career. I actually ended my career at US Cyber Command um, doing um, cyber intel sort of you know globally, more at the strategic level. Um, when I retired from the Coast Guard in 2012, I ended up in DOD contracting doing cybersecurity. And I didn't really end up in cybersecurity on purpose. I, when I was leaving the Coast Guard, they said, hey, we've got these things, these CISSP vouchers, and we need to get rid of them because they're <laughs> going to expire. And I said, I don't know what a CISSP is, but I'm going to retire and I need a job. So I went and I studied I, and I didn't, no one told me it was supposed to be a hard exam. So I go and I buy a couple of books and I read through them like, I'm good. And I go and I take the test. And uh, 400 people in a room, it was a written at that time, it wasn't anything electronic. And I'm sitting there in a room with these 400 people going, what did I get into? <laughs> I race through the test. I'm like the second guy done. I walk out and I go, okay, I failed that, you know, next. <laughs> and turns out I actually passed the test. So <laughs> um, once I once I was a CISSP, it turns out they actually needed people with CISSP. So I ended up in DOD contracting, doing uh, information assurance work, which is, you know, InfoSec, basically the DOD role. Um, did a couple of different jobs as a contractor, bounced around a little bit. Sarasota County Schools doing infrastructure yeah. work. The city of Tallahassee previously doing some infrastructure work. I was uh, Florida Department of Corrections as the information security manager. And then I ended up um, as the CISO for the state of Florida for almost three years, which, which was a really cool opportunity. 
Um, from there, I moved on to the position I'm currently in as CISO from the city of Tallahassee. So I've been all over the place. I guess a lot of your, your career is in, the, is in the public sector. Why do you go down that path? I mean, why, why stick with that? Because, it, you know, there's a lot that uh, – how about this? Thomas Vaughn could be talking to us uh, from the Virgin Islands aboard his helicopter. Yeah, uh, you know, that that's becoming more of a draw now because of remote work and everything. I mean, at some yeah. point, I might want to go work in the Virgin Islands. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, uh, I think I really – I'm drawn to public service because, well, first of all, that's where I started, military career. You kind of get into this, this sort of mentality where I am built to serve and I have to have impact and citizens are what matter and all this other stuff. Um, I sort of took that with me when I left the military. And I think that any work I do has to have some meaning and has to still serve in a sense on whether it's my country or my community or the world even. Um, I think cyber in particular is a way that we can serve, you know, society in general. And then when you add public sector on top of that, I'm essentially serving in two ways. So it, it's just a natural place for me to be. I think um, I think there's more of a need in a, in a sense in the public sector because, because we tend to pay a little bit less and because the work sometimes requires a lot more responsibility of us. You know, we're responsible sometimes for lives, you know, and, and that's, I think that drives a lot of people away from it. So there's a need. I'm filling a need. I'm serving as I've always done. It's just kind of natural. Did you, Thomas, did you have a technology interest, you know, as a young person growing up before you went into the Army? I mean, looking back now, you know, or was it something that developed later? You know, it's interesting. I don't know that I did as a kid. I, I love science fiction. So there was that part of it. Um, I, you know, in high school, ninth grade, I remember Apple IIe's and learning to program in basic. Um, those were the days, 1984, you know, so um, 1984, see, that's cool. <laughs> um, that tells you something right there. So um, I ended up in the military sort of doing technology by accident. I found that I was just very good at it. Um, it surprised me that not everyone naturally gets technology not everyone is comfortable with technology but for me it just it, it was like uh, it's like breathing air it was just easy so it was natural for me to kind of do what i do what do you think that is i mean you know why do you think you were i don't know i'm you know talking about well, you know philosophical type things i mean why do you think it was you were drawn so, to that? you know we we all have talents and we all have some purpose on this earth that we may or may not understand. Um, I think when you find where your talents are, you almost have a responsibility as a human being to follow the, that path. Um, when I discovered that I had some talent with technology, I think that's the role that I was meant to serve and I kind of to follow that path. I hate to make it sound like predestination or anything, but um, it's, it's what I was good at. So I had to do it. Yeah. Yeah. What was it like in the time when you were doing DOD contracting, and then what was it that made you leave the contracting job to go back to the public sector? So DOD contracting was very comfortable because you essentially step out of being in uniform to being a contractor doing almost the same okay. work. Um, so there was there was sort of an ease to it. Um, I think the thing that I didn't like so much about contracting is, is that it's less certain than a lot of jobs. You know, you can you can have a contract in and then you're out of a job and you have to go find another one. And that just didn't appeal to me very much. Um, the thought of actually being and working directly for the public sector seemed more uh, meaningful to me in a sense. And so that's why I dove in. Turns out that the contract work I did was just as important as everything I do now. It just was different. What's, what's some of, I mean, you have a, you've held a lot of jobs, you have a lot of responsibility and now you're, essentially in charge of the cybersecurity for the government's operation in Tallahassee, for, for the Tallahassee city. What, what's something that's like misunderstood about that role? You know, I would say that, you know, cybersecurity in general, especially in the public sector is, well, it's misunderstood in the sense that cybersecurity is so much larger a topic, so much larger in scope than most people give it credit for. When you say cybersecurity to the general public, they assume that a guy like me in city government is, you know, managing a firewall and running some security scans, and, and that's what I do. Um, but the reality is that's just a very small percentage of what I do. There's so much involved in 
understanding where cybersecurity fits in terms of what the city is trying to accomplish in a, in a larger sense. You know, how do how does the work that I do in cybersecurity support the public safety mission? How does what I do in cybersecurity support you know power generation and, and all of that? You know, there's just so much more to it. And, and the interesting thing is that technology has become so much more sort of ubiquitous, and I hate to use, it's an overused term, but, you know, technology is everywhere. Everywhere that technology exists, there has to be some consideration for the security concerns around that technology. And so it means that I have my fingers in literally everything that the city does. And I think looking from the outside, you think I do just a few things, but the reality is I'm doing everything. It's much broader than that. So that's what I'd say. And I think it's different than the public sector because we do a little bit of everything. How do you go about getting everybody on the team to, to understand that? Because I have to believe that's no small feat. It's it's a challenge for a couple of reasons. You know, I, I think for the longest time, cyber issues were thought at, to be purely IT issues. So, yeah. you know, one of the first things that we have to do is try to demonstrate that the risks involved in cyber are risks in general. So we have to demonstrate to leadership that cyber risks fit inside risk management in general. So any risk the city faces can hurt our bottom line or hurt our reputation, impact services. Um, cyber risks are the same way. And I think you have to somehow tie tie the, the direct line between cyber risk and, and general risk. Um, that means sometimes that you have to explain, you know, fairly technical concepts to people who generally aren't technical. Um, and I think that's one of the challenges with it. Yeah. You know, as human beings, we tend to shy away from things that we don't understand or we feel we can't understand, and technology is that way. So um, it's a challenge, but we um, we try to put things in very basic terms. You know, anytime something happens, we tend to use that to our advantage, and it's horrible, but a lot of us cyber guys have to say, okay, we were just hit with ransomware or whatever. Now I need to make an issue of that. I have to use that as an example because that may be the best opportunity I have to really state my case, unfortunately. Do you, like – there's been a lot, as there always are, because there are a lot of cities and municipalities throughout Florida. But, you know, when you see a headline that impacts a comparably sized city or a smaller or a larger city, do, do you think few like there goes us or can you ever use a headline that affects another city to help advance your your mission? We can and we do. Um, I, I think that one of the cautions I have with that is that what I know about what happened in another city is generally what I read in the media, and that may be all I have for a source of information. Um, I've seen time and time again that the media doesn't, tends not to quite get the story right. It leaves out key details. Um, sometimes things are over-dramatized to, to make a point in the media. So when I hear about what happened to the next city over, if I read it in the media, I may not have an accurate picture. So I have to be careful about using it as an example because it may not be a true example, if, if that makes sense. It's funny, you, you, you're talking about that because we spend a bit of time talking about information sharing and, and how do we you know, move things quicker across. Um, and, you know, the, you're finding out about incidents that happen at other places on the news. But I don't think there's anybody that would disagree that say information sharing is key. Why is it so hard? Why? I mean, why is that so – from your chair, I mean, I, I know you, you've seen it on so many different levels on the on the – the federal, the Department of Defense, the you know the Coast Guard side, the military side, um, the state side, and now at the, even at the uh, the city and county side. What do, what are you know? So why is it so hard? It, it, well, it just is. But I mean, <laughs> you might, it's, no, it's funny. Yeah, it, it's yeah. hard, man. What are you yeah. asking? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there 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 are a lot of things to consider. That's kind of a loaded question. You know, the, yeah. the thing is is. Politics comes into play to a certain extent. You know, if if I am a government entity and something goes wrong in terms of cyber in, in my government, do I really want to talk about that with other people? Do I really want to share that I have a weakness or that I had a failing? So so there's a challenge. It's human nature not to want to talk about the yeah. things we didn't do well. I, I had a therapist tell me, shame lives in the shade, man. We got to yeah, shine the light it's, on it. It's, shine it's the light true. on it. And, and no one has more shame than government. So, right. I, mean, it, I mean, if you look at it that but way. But is there... Um, is there networking that goes on? I mean, even informally where, I mean, you've held a lot of different positions and you're a pretty well-known guy, Thomas. I mean, is, do, do CISOs who are starting their journey, you know, come to you and ask you for advice? Is there any sort of informal stuff that goes on? You know, I, I think that 
once a relationship's built with another person in the practitioner, there is some information sharing that happens naturally, but building that relation is hard sometimes. I think we don't spend enough time in this world, you know, in the cyber world, building those relationships. And it's something that I've always spent a lot of time on. So two things helped me from my experience. One, being in the Coast Guard for 20 years, you know, the Coast Guard's a small service. We always had to collaborate to get things done. You know, we could never do it by ourselves. So I have sort of a collaborative mentality where when I get into a role, the first thing I do is, is I look around my organization. I say, okay, what can the next organization overdo for me? How can I communicate them? How can we start sharing? It's just natural. The other thing, you know, I have some intelligence background and my formal education, I actually have a master's degree in strategic intelligence. Um, I look at things from an intelligence perspective, which means the first thing I do, one of the first things I do is I sit down and I say, what are my requirements? What information requirements do I have? What do I need to answer? Which yeah. questions need answering? And when you think in terms of, you know, officially outlining the questions you need to answer, then you can go forth a little more, um, a little in a little more organized fashion in gathering that information and gathering that information almost always requires me to interact with other entities and to start sharing and collaborating. So I'm sort of driven by those two perspectives. So you mentioned, you know, relationships um, and building those relationships. Uh, you know, how do you do that? What's, what do you think the most important aspect of, of building those relationships? How, you know, how do you go about doing that? I think that, so I'm going to get philosophical. I know that do it, man. Cool. Do it. Um, Philosophically, you know, the only way that we can really build relationships, whether it's, you know, between two individuals or between groups or whatever, is we have to have some level of trust. Um, I think that building trust is really the focus. Um, if, if I want an organization or a person to trust me, I have to demonstrate that I'm willing to trust them. The only way I can do that is by sort of opening the kimono and just sharing mm -hmm. what I have. Um, I think it means that, you know, I have to be willing to give till it hurts a little bit in the beginning of a relationship. I have to be willing to say, here's what we know. Here's what we're doing wrong. You know, how can we help you? What, how can you help us? You know, sort of being honest and, and open, I think, is, is really the beginning of that. Um, for some groups, some organizations, that works and, and you'll, you'll get some buy-in and they'll start doing the same thing and, and then you have a good relationship and some don't. And, and yeah. then you have to sort of reassess and try some different things. But it's all about trust. And trust means I have to be the first one to give. I have to walk into the room with a gift first before they're going to give back. So. Yeah. Thomas, can you give us an example of a time when maybe you did something that was outside of your comfort zone? Kind of what happened when that happened? So I'm introverted by nature. So being here is kind of outside my comfort <laughs> zone. That's not a good example. Um, I... Uh, it's, it's I don't know how I feel about that. Meaning that this that you that this makes you uncomfortable. I mean, listen, well, it's us. It's the no password okay. crew. Specifically, Ernie, you make me uncomfortable. <laughs> oh. I, just, I didn't want to say that on camera because that seemed a little bit cruel. But um, <laughs> it hurts, man. It hurts. It's because of the Air Force thing, but it's okay. I, <laughs> I mean, the Marines, man. It's the Marines. Oh, Marines! Is that what yeah. it is? See, oh, that even hurts even more. Oh. Yeah, it's not even better. It's I was trying to be the benefit <laughs> anyway. <laughs> And I come from the Coast Guard. Who am I pointing fingers at, right? Listen, the um, Space Force. You can, yeah, you can exactly. point at the Space I'll, Force I'll now. That. That is, yeah. I watch it and I go, yeah, that's how it is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, there was a question I was going to answer here somewhere, I think. Well, what was uh, something you did outside your comfort zone. You took a risk. Right, right. Aside um, from the podcast, by the way. Yeah, aside from the podcast. So, um, you know, when I was in uniform, um, still in the Coast Guard, it was about 2010. I was stationed in D.C., the um, the new World War II memorial was um, built, and they were going to dedicate it. And there was this big hoopla. They were doing all these different things in town. Um, one of the things they were doing is the um, they were putting on a live performance, a play of sorts, and it was for all of the World War II veterans that would be coming to town. And they chose um, actual active duty military folks to play all the roles. Um, you know, you had Army, Air Force, Marines and all that stuff. And then they said, well, we want a couple of token Coasties because we can't leave them out. Um, I, for whatever reason, raised my hand, you know, when they when they came to Coast Guard headquarters and they said, we want volunteers. Everyone looked at them with blank stares. And I said, I'll do it. <laughs> and, and then I found out they weren't offered lunch or anything. I thought it was something else. But it, it ended up working out for me. Um, I, I went and I so I stood, you know, on the stage 
in front of 20,000 people at a time. We did four different sessions of this thing. And I acted on the stage, having never done anything like that before. We rehearsed for months beforehand. Um, yeah, I thought it was going to be horrible. And, you know, leading up to it was very difficult for me. I found once I got on stage, it wasn't that bad. You know, even as an introvert, when you are not you and you're someone else because you're playing someone else on the stage, it, I found it really wasn't that bad. But going into it, man, it was, uh, you know, I questioned what I was doing and, you know, what I was thinking. And uh, it was it was hard. What um, what, but, uh, what part did you play? What uh, what, what did you what so, did you have to? So yeah. I don't don't remember the lines or anything. So don't ask that. No, but, no. Yeah. I mean, it was 10 years ago, uh, 12 now. Um, I was, uh, so there was these scenes from like in World War II, and then there was sort of a modern day scene that was like one of the characters in modern day. It was like an old man. And I played one of those roles. And they actually put all the powder in my hair and drew on the wrinkles and everything. I actually have a picture somewhere. It looks cool. I mean, I look like an old guy. Um, like I do now. I wasn't um, going to say that. I and, wasn't uh, going to go there, but you know, hey. Yeah, I know. It, it's funny. It took 10 or 12 years. I'll do that to you. Um, I, as a CISO, will do it to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, uh, so I did that role as, you know, playing the older version of one of the characters and I had my lines. It was like right at the end of the play. And so I got to have some of the last lines and then there was a standing ovation, all that. It was cool. It was really cool. That's really cool. I mean, looking back on the career to where you are now, you know, if you were transported back to a time when, you know, there's a, a 10 year old nicknamed mouse, you're sitting on a park bench, and you've got your toy Rom. Would you approach him and offer him some advice? By so, the way, you have to elaborate on, uh, yeah, on Rom because yeah, I know who it is, but there are those that may not yeah. know who Rom so, is. So first off, the mouse thing was a nickname when I was a kid because I was so quiet. Actually, one of my, I think in elementary school, they gave me the nickname that stuck. Um, you wouldn't believe it now listening to him talk so much. But the, um, the so Rom the Space Knight was this really cool toy. It was about a foot tall, made out of plastic. It had little red LED lights and a little gun that would shoot. It was all red LEDs and you had little buttons on the back that you could turn it on with. Um, Rom was um, a character that was created and then there was a comic book series created just to sell the toy like they did back yeah. in those days where they would create comic yeah, books. G.I. Joe was the same way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And um, I love that toy. It was the coolest thing in the world. And I, I'd love to have another one, actually. I, I've looked for them online, but there were so few of them made that you can't get one for less than $600. And, and they're they're just not in good condition anymore or anything. But I digress. Um, I don't think it's all, a digression. I think that's a... It's an important yeah, well, history that doesn't that needs to be captured because otherwise probably, we're going to lose it. Probably we'll lose the it. most important part of the conversation. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, ten-year-old me on a bench, older me. Well, uh, did I mention I'm an introvert? So, the ten-year-old version of me probably would not let the adult version of me get near him. <laughs> so, there probably would be a problem in that. Um, well, stranger danger, man. Yeah, you know? exactly. Well, you know, it was it was the 70s and 80s. I don't think we believed in street. Yeah, it hadn't got there yet. <laughs> like, fine, come on in. Um, you know, I think, I don't think that I would have told myself to do anything differently than I, that I've done it. I think I would have said, you know, good luck, best wishes, enjoy the ride, just go with it. You know, because, you know, I've been very fortunate in that I have had a, a very good career and um, even though I haven't always had a solid plan, I've always ended up in the right place. I've always volunteered for the right things. I've always, you know, sort of, you know, pitched in when I needed to. And it's always been good for me. I think, yeah, this is, is kind of sappy, but I think, you know, I see myself as making the best of what was given me and it's been good for me. And I, I think I would want the child version of me to, to approach life the same way. Well, yeah. thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, we're going to take a short break now. And we're going to return and take a hard pivot to Ernie's Lifestyle Polygraph. So stay with us. You're listening to the No Password Required podcast. We cover cybersecurity and a lot of other stuff. All right. Welcome back. Thomas, we have a segment now. It is called the Lifestyle Polygraph. As you know, the Lifestyle Polygraph is a tool used by the National Security Establishment to vet individuals for access to highly sensitive information. But here, on No Password Re Required, we use it to probe the inner 
the inner mind and inner workings of those, uh, those, uh, those guests. And so uh, these questions may, may be an intrusive. They may make you feel uncomfortable, but that's kind of the whole point. Um, so that said, are you ready? No, <laughs> but go ahead anyway. Well, whether, whether you like it or not, here we go. All right, here we are with a series of five questions. We're going to start here. Here's the first question. First question. What are the best and worst things, best and worst things about social media? Wow, I think there's been studies done on this. So uh, so first off, um, the, the best and worst thing about social media is essentially the same thing. You know, really, social media allows practically virtually anyone to have a voice um, and for that voice to be broadcast wide. I think that means that on the on the negative end of the scale, it means that people that probably shouldn't be broadcasting their voices wide and shouldn't be heard are, are able to be heard. You know, and we've seen it time and time again, people trying to speak about things that are not true or try to trying to subvert us or trying to mislead us. Um, that's the bad side, you know, of, of having a voice is that sometimes the voice is not a positive one. Um, on the other end of it, you know, I think that because anyone can have a voice, sometimes the smallest voices can be heard. And I think that's especially true for social issues. Um, it's important in countries where people don't generally aren't allowed to have a voice if, if they can use social media as a platform. I think that's real positive. Um, I also think that it allows us to connect with people that we would not otherwise be able to connect with. You know, we can connect globally with individuals in a way that we never could before. So that's very positive. Are there any websites or blogs or maybe not social media, but anything that, that you look to for sources of information on cybersecurity? You know, it, it changes. And, and that's the thing with these social media platforms. You know, one can be more or less useful today and then it can shift yeah. over time to become less useful. So um, I have always been um, a pretty big fan of Reddit. You know, mm. I, I like that there are lots of ideas that are shared and lots of conversations that are had. Um, and some of that seems to be still very useful um, because there's so much variety. There's a lot of bad stuff there too, but Reddit seems to be sort of my go-to. Mm. Um, I am not a big fan of most of the other platforms, to be honest. I just, you know, the only presence that I have personally is on LinkedIn and that's only because that's kind of expected professional. So. Yeah. 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 Huh. It's like uh, you, sometimes viewing Reddit from the lens of a professional can make it a lot easier because you can sort the good from the bad. It's like, you know, you can't find the needle in the haystack on the internet unless you know someone, had, someone reliable has told you what a needle looks like. Yeah. All right, here we go. You mentioned earlier that you do like science fiction. Dependent upon how your answer will alienate a significant portion of the world's populace. So there's no pressure on this. Star Wars or Star Trek? So this question was about science fiction. So first of all, let's clarify. Um, Star Wars is not science fiction. Star Wars is fantasy. You know, and if, and if you're a purist like I am, you recognize there's a difference between science fiction and science fantasy. Um, so there's really only one choice if you're talking science fiction, it's Star Trek. So, you know, you kind of put me in a corner there to give me much option. <laughs> Um, I have always been a Star Trek fan. Um, I'm actually re-watching The Next Generation right now from front to end for the, about the 10th time. Um, I just can never get tired of Star Trek. Um, I think, you know, because it's got kind of a military structure to it, I just, it's always been very appealing to me. You know, all of, there's not, um, there's not a version of Star Trek I don't like. I will say that the most recent one, Discovery, is different, and it's different in a way that that makes it it just puts it in a different category from the other Star Trek series. Um, but I've always been a Star Trek guy. And to be clear, I love Star Wars, but it's not <laughs> science fiction. Let's be clear about that. That's interesting. That's see, listen, I like that. That, that was see, and I did that without alienating anybody. Really? I like that. Yeah. Politics. Yes. That's exactly correct. I, uh, I, I mean, about politics. So. No, but that's a good, I mean, that point is a very good one to make because it, yeah. And it's like, it came up recently. There's a new video game, um, called, I think it's called Horizon Zero Dawn 2. It's a sequel. And I think I read a review of it and it was saying, it made that point. It was like, this is a fantasy. You're, you know, 
there's it's not hardcore science fiction. It made that distinction, which I never applied it to Star Wars before, but it does explain a lot of it. Is there a character from Star Trek who you know you would you either identify with most or or who you think is a good role model for for CISOs? So it sounded like you had a hard time saying Star Trek. I can tell Star, you who they are Star Wars. Star Trek. Um, Listen, the beard, the beard. He's, he's an op- closet Obi Wan fan. I, I'm oh, I'm pretty okay. good yeah, with fine. the next generation. I, I know that, but I kind of lost the thread after that. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll I'll give you some points for that. Um, so you know, I wouldn't say that the character that that I most identify with has any lessons for CISOs yeah. or cybersecurity, but. Um, there's a character that is in both Next Generation and Deep Space Nine, uh, Miles O'Brien. Um, he is sort of an average guy, but he he demonstrates heroism and practicality. He's also very intelligent, but that doesn't get flaunted a lot. He's sort of an average Joe who does great things in both those series. Um, I think he's more of a real person than a lot of the other characters are, and I identify with that a little bit more. I've always liked that. Cool. All right, here we go. This is a tough one. What is more critical in helping to achieve a just society? This is going back to that philosophical base, right? What is more critical in helping to achieve a just society? The spirit of the law or the letter of the law? Wow. So that that's that's a big one. Um, so I do have feelings on that, you know, obviously some philosophy on it. Uh, you know, so both are important, but they're important in context. I think a lot of times in the work that I do, um, you have to consider both. So there are things we do in applying security controls that very much have to follow the letter of the law. They have to be done a very specific way. Um, there are other things we do in terms of managing risk that require us to be a little bit creative and to to compromise to a certain extent to meet whatever the spirit of that security control is. So I think both of those things come into play. I think in society, the same is true. I think, you know, we will see the letter of the law as being something that applies to speeding. You know, if I'm speeding on the interstate, if I'm doing more than the speed limit, letter of law says I'm speeding and I get a ticket, that's very clear and it's a very good application of the letter of the law. Um, spirit of the law, though, I think applies more to what I would call more human concerns around the law. You know, if if there is a, a criminal case that involves some heinous crime, um, the way that a person is judged for their participation in that crime becomes very much about the spirit of the law. You know, are we trying as a society to reform that individual? Are we trying to judge their behavior and correct that? for the individual, maybe even for the people around them, or are we trying to punish them? And, you know, what, what is the real spirit of what we're trying to accomplish? And I think the spirit of the law matters more when those concerns are more human in their effects, if that makes sense. Very nuanced and philosophical, I might add. Yeah, very philosophical. I like that. I try to sound philosophically when I'm not. No, that's right. You know, almost, you're almost the Aristotle of CISOs right here. That's, you know, I, I, I don't know. Uh, th- th- those philosophing pe- people will come back and say, no, he's more like uh, Plato. And I, I probably won't know enough to debate him one way or the other, which will make yeah. me look bad, so thanks. The next question. <laughs> what would you like to have an unlimited supply of? You know, I, I guess we all would want um, as much money as we, we could put into a dump truck. But, you know, really, I, um, I've i got a little bit of a sweet tooth, and, and I, I like um, – I still eat a lot of candy, you know, man in my fifties, I probably shouldn't eat as much candy as I do, but, um, I love Skittles, you know, and if, if I had an unlimited supply of anything, it probably would be Skittles. I, I like the, um, the wild berry variety that's in the purple pack. I'm just something about those things. And they, they used to have some green packs that were called orchard, which tasted more like apples and, oh, nice. and pears and things. Those were really cool. I don't know why they don't have those anymore, but, um, Again, I'm getting probably too far down in the weeds, but Skittles no. is a short answer. I actually could speak on specific varieties if necessary. Yeah, that's impressive. That's impressive. I mean, um, yeah, that's a good question. What, what happened to the orchard Skittle packs? Those things were awesome, and I just don't know. The ones, the wild berry are like second best, and those are the ones that survived. I just don't understand. I live in, I live in a high-traffic 
uh, Halloween neighborhood uh, in Tampa, Florida. And we put out every year the somewhat equal amount of Skittles and somewhat equal amount of uh, Snickers bars. And the Skittles goes almost immediately. It is, mm-hmm. it is the preference of it – is, it is more popular than I think most people realize in terms of a snack – I think if you you know look at a checkout line, you see this the fact that it can support multiple varieties, even in a uh, in a checkout line is is additional evidence of that. So, you're I think you're right, uh, Thomas. There's a lot of our listeners who are on board with you about Skittles. Yeah. All right, and here we are, the last one. If cybersecurity went away tomorrow, now we're talking science fantasy here. If it went away tomorrow, what would you do? What would you want to do? Well, you know, I've, I've had a lot of different things I've done in my career. And, and I think the one thing that I still t- uh, tinker with a little bit is I am a part-time and a volunteer firefighter in EMT. Um, I think if I could do anything, that's what I'd do. And, and granted, I'm getting a little old it, physically. That can be a bit demanding. But um, I just love sort of the hands-on, you know, running out and doing something that immediately benefits another human being and seeing that it's like immediate gratification because I just don't have much of an attention span anyway. So um, I think I would probably be a firefighter. You know, I actually, I do a couple shifts a month as a firefighter now as in an EMT. Um, I drive an ambulance quite a bit. I'm a volunteer firefighter. So it is already kind of a second job to me. So it would just be a natural place to go. Okay. okay, that's you have nothing more to give, Thomas. You're giving everything. That's right. You're giving everything. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> well, it, it, apparently I haven't given enough because I don't have that limitless supply of Skittles yet. I need to do something to earn that, and I'm not sure. I'm, I'm searching for that. You're Someone chasing that me, one. Like, yeah. yeah, I'm chasing it. Yeah, that's yeah. my dream. We, we we've come to the end of it, but I want to throw out a bonus question, Thomas. And and this is you know yeah. if you're palling around with other CISOs, you're at a you're at a you're at a, a Cyber Florida meeting, and there's a lot of other folks there who are also um, city CISOs. Have you ever met one for the first time, and you think to yourself only, that city is toast? Yes. <laughs> yeah. and I, it's, it, it's, it's horrible because, you know, I and this happens – it happens with CISOs. It also happens a lot with vendors where <laughs> someone will come in and you're like, I yeah. want to sell you this really cool, super technical thing. And then they start explaining it. I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about. You, you got nothing no here. Clue. Yeah. And I do not want to buy anything from you because you do not have a clue. Um, there are, there are lots of folks in positions like these that really don't get it. And, you know, I, I'm not, so I don't have much of an ego, so I'm not going to say that my way is the right way necessarily. But there are some fundamental things about what we do that some people just don't grasp, and, and it's unfortunate. But, yeah, and when I see that, you know, I kind of have to walk away because I don't know what to say to a person like that. I'm kind of like, you know, you're in this job, and you don't really get it, so what do I say? I mean, do we talk about the weather? And that's not much fun. So I, I just – it makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> So if you see me wrinkle my nose and go the other way, it means I probably don't have much confidence in the ability, <laughs> oh, just, just for future reference. Wait a minute. That's, that, that reminds me of the last time we talked. <laughs> oh, did, uh, I'm, I'm going to get up and walk away now. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of walking away, um, Thomas, uh, you know, I really want to thank you for, uh, for taking time out of your day to talk to us. It's, uh, it, you know, it's been really, really good to talk to you and, and, uh, and hear your views on things. Um, you know, usually we send our listeners to the uh, to the guest social media uh, presence, but uh, seeing how you aren't on there a lot, we're going to mix it up. Um, and so uh, why don't you tell our listeners uh, why they should visit Tallahassee? Um, well, don't visit Tallahassee <laughs> because if, if you come here, then the city may grow and I'll have more work to do. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, no, so Tallahassee is a great town, you know. Tallahassee is, it, it has the feel of a, of a Floridian town, and yet it also feels very much like a deep south town. You know, we've got a little bit of everything to offer. You know, we're not right on the coast, but we're not that far away. Um, the This city is known for its tree canopies. You know, there are trees everywhere here, um, either by design or by accident. When they built the city, they designed it so trees could just grow wherever they needed to. There's a ton of parks here. Um, it's just a beautiful town. And, you know, I think um, it has a lot to offer. You know, 
and also because it's sort of the center for government, state, and, and everything else in this um, in Florida, it's it's just a really a really interesting place to be. It's not a super big city, but it's got everything that you need, and you also have access to everything that's happening. I mean, it's just it's a really cool place. And I should add that I don't live in the city. No, I actually live outside <laughs> the city, so maybe I'm not the best guy to ask. But I, I actually think it's a pretty cool. Town, so. <laughs> Well, thanks again for joining us. Yes, sir. Uh, and coming up next, we're going to have Technologue with Pablo Torres. Stay tuned. All good things must come to an end, but we're not there yet. Welcome to the Technologue with Pablo Torres. Welcome to Technologue. I'm your host, Pablo Torres. We've noticed a problem on the internet. If you've been paying attention, you've probably noticed it too. The majority of websites you visit are tracking you. They are collecting information about who you are, where you are, and what you're doing on their websites. The Norton Lab study reveals that top trackers can see 73% of an average user's browsing history, despite appearing a small number of unique domains. Uh, the Norton Lab study shows that consumers are, on, on average are encountering 177 tracking organizations in one week. They will encounter half of those trackers in the first two hours of browsing. In other words, if the user were to start over with a fresh browser, it would only take two hours on average to re-encounter 50% of all those trackers. That, that's that's really invasive. That's bananas. <laughs> it would only take two hours on average to re-encounter half the trackers. That is persistent. And I hope, yeah, that's, wow. Um, that's yeah. like when you move and the junk mail follows. Um, Every two hours, which is repopulated. <laughs> so what, I mean, just to back up a second, what is web tracking, Pablo? Yep. Uh, web tracking is the practice by which websites identify and collect information about users. Uh, so it's, it's interesting. I, I think it's a very sophisticated way to evolve the way that people can market to potential clients. Um, however, this is generally in the form of some sort of subset of web browsing history. Generally, tr tracking involves collecting information about your use of uh, your interaction with a particular web page. And websites also use these trackers to collect personal information, such as your IP address, where you came from, your geographic location, your browser characteristics. What's a little bit of the guts behind this? Like, how do these things actually do that? Yeah, so that that's a really good question. Whenever you use the internet, you leave a record, a digital footprint of the websites that you visit, along with everything that you click. To track this information, many websites save a small piece of data embedded in invisible objects um, or they're, they're using your user accounts and hardware configuration to identify what type of user is interacting with the domain. But so I know there's like a difference too between first party and third party web tracking. Can you just kind of walk us through that? Yeah, that's an interesting one. And I kind of had to research that one to get some, uh, some, some viable comparable options. But uh, let's go with the New York Times. The New York, the New York Times knows you visited and knows which article you're reading. In this case, the New York Times is a first party because you chose to visit a first party. We are not particularly concerned about what the first party knows from you since it's a conscious decision out of your own volition to go there. A third party tracker like doubleclick.net, however, is embedded by the New York Times to provide, for example, targeted advertising, and they can log the user's visit to the New York Times. In other words, though, Third party web tracking refers to the practice by which an entity, the tracker, other than the website directly visited by the user, tracks or assists in tracking the user's visit to the site. Once there's one third party on a page, that third party has the ability to turn around and invite any number of other third parties to the first page, to the first party web page. I mean, this, this creates content overload. You just have all these in, in, like data sources and data points bombarding you with information just based on your web browsing activity. All right, so what are some of the most common of these web tracking tools? Oh man, there was a, there was a creepy one that I'm gonna get to, but uh, let's start, start off with cookies. Um, and then we'll jump into browsing fingerprinting. Cookies are a small piece of data, each limited to about four kilobytes, placed in a browser storage by the web server. You can think of cookies a bit like a wristband. If you attend a concert and you put on a wristband, the door staff will recognize you. And if you leave, you get to come back, right? A browsing fingerprint, however, is a highly accurate way to identify and track users wherever they go online. The information collected is quite comprehensive, often includes the browser type, version, 
operating system and the version of the screen resolution as well as supported fonts, plugins and time zone and your language and your font preferences and your hardware configurations. That's a mouthful. That's a lot of information that, that is uniquely identifiable to your operating specific machine uh, components. These identifiers may seem generic and not at all personally identifying, but typically only one in several million people have exactly the same specifications as you. If a user did not see the benefit of these things and wanted to protect themselves, what are some ways that they could sort of limit the footprints that they leave on the internet? And, and, and this is a great question. Um, I, I am a huge proponent of the open source community and the supporting these projects that provide plugin extensions for both Chrome and Firefox. But uh, let, let's, let's look at it this way. Trackers run as scripts that, that run when you load a web page. These scripts are invisible to you, but collect information about you, including your IP address and browsing behavior. You can easily download the tracker blockers and the plugins and the whatnot. They will keep trackers from collecting information from your browser. But another way uh, that these browser extensions protect you is by preventing the trackers from using cookies or fingerprinting tracking on your browser. Another way, which is which is genius, um, is VPNs. Uh, VPNs create a connection between multiple physical networks and, and most encrypt the connection. For example, if you're connected to your home Wi-Fi network but need to connect to your company's intranet, your internal intranet, VPNs allow you to do this. VPNs keep your browsing experience more sanitized and more clean. VPNs keep your browsing, essentially VPNs keep your browsing activity private by redirecting your network connection through another virtual network in a different location. Um, this is gonna prevent websites from collecting your real IP address or actual geographic location, which is, which is great. Um, so I think if you are really concerned about your privacy, however much disinformation you can throw out into the wild, the better. Little chaff, throw it out there, throw them off your scent. Little, little chaff, yeah. right? Yeah, no, and then that, this was an interesting segment. So um, it, it definitely it was a brain teaser, and it's it's kind of cringeworthy seeing how much information gets aggregated for one specific user profile. And we don't even look at it that way. We're just like, whatever. We're accessing a website, and we're just going to go from point A to point B. Data data is king. Yeah, I mean, it's, this is why we have a free internet, though. I mean, if if this all gets stopped, then the advertising slows down or is less valuable. And I think. You know, it, it has been solved to the extent it can be with disclosures. And, you know, jurisdictions that have looked at this have just said, just tell us what you're doing with cookies. Give us some ownership and choice over it. And you can continue doing it because it's the cookies that allows for the web to exist, for you to read free journalism online, mm -hmm. for you to interact in social media without having to pay for it. Um, and, you know, I think it's one thing to, to – it is a little – I don't know, scary to think that there's all this stuff out there, but I'm affirmatively using these websites. The, the thing that makes me nervous is that I don't know how it's being used. Yeah. If I know how, to, how it's being used and I have choices about it, then I'm okay with it um, because that's the price I'm willing to pay for using it. And if I'm going to look at an ad, I'd rather look at an ad for a product I want to buy than for something that I have no interest in. Yeah. So I, I, I see it a little bit differently, but I, I do um, it, that... <laughs> Browsing fingerprinting is is that's pretty interesting, Pablo. Yeah. That that's yeah, that that that's an interesting one, Jack. And um, the the I guess the the dark side of the coin when it comes to the cookies would be the potential attack for a cookie hijacking, um, which is a cyber attack in which an attacker is going to take over the the legitimate user's computer session. And uh, what what's going to happen there is that this individual, whoever the, the nefarious actor is. They're going to obtain uh, that user session ID and act on that user's behalf on any number of network services that that user is plugged into. Wow. So uh, if, if let's say, for example, uh, we're, we're buying the commemorative 20 year, uh, no password required Rolexes, and uh, it goes off of uh, Rex's account. And uh, next thing we know, these Rolexes aren't being delivered to Tampa, Florida, but instead they're being delivered to somewhere in the middle of the desert in Arizona. <laughs> that would be unfortunate. <laughs> well, that depends so, because we all know that uh, – that Ted, uh, our esteemed uh, sound engineer, is going to be living in uh, Arizona at that time. He, uh, I think, I think we've looked into the future and we've seen that. Um, no cookies for you, Ted. No <laughs> cookies. <for you. laughs> all right. Well, th that brings us to another end to another program. And thank you all for joining us. First and foremost, I have to thank my co-hosts, Jack Clabby and Pablo Torres. Without them, the show is not that great. Uh, it's actually fantastic with them. I'm glad that they're with us. And a special thanks to our guest, Thomas Vaughn. Uh, Thomas Vaughn 
you know, he likes to think of himself as an average Joe doing remarkable things. And I would tell you this, that he's far beyond that. He's a remarkable philosopher, Sizzo, and uh, I'm so glad he was able to join us today. Um, so that said, remember to rate, review, and subscribe to the No Password Required podcast. You can find us on social media at No Password Pod and send your questions or comments to info at nopasswordpodcast.com. And if you share your info, we'll send you along some show swag. As always, I'm Ernie Farresso. Thank you again for listening, and we'll talk again soon. Thank you for listening to the No Password Required podcast. The show is produced by Cyber Florida. A special thanks goes out to our friends at Carlton Fields and Second Watch. If you would like to learn more about the show, visit our website at cyberflorida.org slash pod. And if you still need more show content, check out our social media at NoPasswordPod.